if you get your views from television news you'll only hear stories that corporations choose you'll only get to see what they want you to see you're gonna have to read and decide what you believe We all watched in horror 911. The planes hit the towers and the towers came down. Did you ever wonder how they fell so fast? Well, maybe that's a question that we're not supposed to ask. Don't you think it's strange There were no fighter jets Did someone give the order right. not to... Well, 9-11 was an inside job. But it marks not... It isn't just the first inside job we've had. What it marks is our awakening. Hey, you know... We've had them do this to us too many times, and each time the government has some sort of a phony blank blank excuse. But it, it started a long time ago. I, you know, take for instance the Oklahoma City bombings. We blamed it on Timothy McVeigh, the lone gunman, right? Well, we're going to be showing a DVD pretty soon here, cut number 10 on, this, on our roll ins, that. Uh, Basically, uh, it's a cut showing, I think it's Loose Change, or We Are Change, sorry, We Are Change Oklahoma. And they've got 10 reasons why the Oklahoma City bombing was an inside job, why, why you shouldn't believe the government story. But we, we got the same problem on both 9-11 and all of these have one thing in common. The news that comes out at the very beginning talks about multiple explosions, we even had uh, video of the Oklahoma City bomb squad removing unexploded ordnance from Oklahoma City. Uh, and then it never got spoken of again because it didn't fit the lie. It didn't fit the cover story. It didn't fit the government story. Did you know that the government tested out the plot by blowing up a rider truck before the Oklahoma City bombing? Did you know that? Well, it's now a declassified document. They declassify it. They figure that, oh, they will never read things like that. But now there are too many people doing this research. And that, that's what I want to focus this episode on. This episode of 9-11 was an inside job. Everybody needs to carry a camera at all times and use it whenever you see anything that you need to film. Whenever you're in a protest, especially, if everybody had cameras, they couldn't stop us from getting the news out. Well, are you guys ready to play that? Okay, we're going to go ahead and play that, and uh, when I come back, we'll talk some more about it. This is James Lane from We Are Change Oklahoma, and this is the top 10 reasons to question the official story of the Oklahoma City bombing. For more information, go to okcbombingtruth.com. Reason number one, Timothy McVeigh was said to be the only person driving the rider truck full of explosives to the Murrah building on the morning of the bombing. The government was only able to produce one witness placing him in Oklahoma City on that day. Nearly all of the witnesses who saw Timothy McVeigh in the rider truck on the day of the bombing report seeing him with other accomplices both that day and during his preparation for the bombing. In spite of this, the government still claims that Timothy McVeigh was the sole actor in the tragedy of April 19, 1995. Reason number two, why was the ATF AWOL? Paramedic Tiffany Bible, who was on the scene within five minutes, has stated in an affidavit 
that agents of the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms told her that they were not in their office that morning. EMT Catherine Mallett also overheard one ATF agent say to another, is that why we got the page not to come in today? Bruce Shaw, who was interviewed on KFOR TV, was also told by ATF agents that they had been paged not to come in to work. ATF agents initially denied these claims and now variously claim that one of their agents was in a free-falling elevator. This has been disproved. Or that they had been on an all-night stakeout or that they had been at a golf tournament. As they try to sort out their lies, all we want to know is, did the ATF receive a warning? And if so, why did they not pass it on to others in the Murrah building? Reason number three, several survivors reported feeling multiple explosions. Jane Graham even reported eight to 10 seconds before the bomb, an earthquake-like sensation. The University of Oklahoma seismograph also reported two separate events 10 seconds apart. How can this be if there was only one bomb? Reason number four, explosives experts refute the official story. Air Force General Benton Parton, who for years headed the Air Force Armaments Laboratory, studied the evidence carefully and concluded the massive destruction was primarily the result of four demolition charges placed at critical structural points at the third floor level. Likewise, Dr. Sam Cohen, the inventor of the neutron bomb, studied the evidence and said, I believe that the demolition charges in the building were placed inside at certain key concrete structural columns and did the primary damage to the Murrah building. Furthermore, it would have been absolutely impossible and against the laws of nature for a truck full of fertilizer and fuel oil to have caused the damage we saw at the Murrah building. So who placed those demolition charges and why haven't they been brought to justice? Number five, more bombs found in the building. Numerous police officers, first responders, and eyewitnesses report that more than one unexploded bombing bomb was found in the building during the rescue efforts, which resulted in additional evacuations of the Murrah building after the initial damage, which was later attributed to baseless bomb scares. Oklahoma City Fire Marshal Dick Miller reported that the, there was a second bomb found with a 10-minute timer set to target the first responders, and OETA, Public Broadcasting in Oklahoma, reported that the bomb scares were contrived in order to make the media pull away from the scene, even though many victims were abandoned during the evacuations. As the media outlets and the various agencies involved struggle to sort out their stories, all we ask is who planted these bombs and why is the government lying about them? Reason number six, more than one informant way before the bombing told federal agencies that the Oklahoma City Federal Building would be bombed. ATF informant Carol Howe was able to expose Elum City. She had infiltrated it. In Elum City was linked directly to Timothy McVeigh. She was able to name five other people as possible accomplices to Timothy McVeigh's bombing of the Oklahoma City Federal Building. 2020 picked up the story. A few nights before the story was to air, someone from the Department of Justice called ABC, and as a result of that call, the story was canceled. Number seven, foreknowledge. It's interesting to note the foreknowledge that may have been had three to four days before the Oklahoma City bombing took place. A call came in to the Walter Reed Army Hospital. A nurse there took the call. The call came in from the Pentagon, or really from a liaison to the governor's office here in Oklahoma. The question that was being asked was about the triage for blast pressure or blast overpressure. What's interesting is that informa information about those calls was never subpoenaed, nor was it talked about during the investigation. So really why was that call made and what information was had days before the bombing? Number eight, the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad at the federal courthouse before the bombing. We have several witnesses, including Oklahoma County Assessors, Oklahoma County Board of Elections, and we have private investigators as well as attorneys that all report seeing the bomb squad down there as early as 6.15 that morning before the multiple explosions emulated from the AP Murrah building on April 19, 1995. 
We also have an account of a man named Randall Yount who met an acquaintance who was on the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad that met him down at the bomb scene that said, yes, we've been down here since early this morning. We got a tip that there was going to be a bomb down here. We thought it was at the courthouse, and it turns out it wasn't. So a question we're asking is why was the Oklahoma County Bomb Squad down there at 6.15 that morning? Who tipped them off that there was going to be an explosion down here in Oklahoma City? Number nine, the extra left leg. According to Stephen Jones, Timothy McVeigh's attorney, state medical examiner Vernon Jordan has stated, we have eight people with traumatically amputated left legs, yet we have nine legs. Also adding that the chances of someone being buried with two right legs to be zero. Chief pathologist of Northern Ireland, T.K. Marshall, having performed 2,500 autopsies on bombing victims, has also stated, there is never an unknown victim. Therefore, we must assume that this leg must belong to a perpetrator close enough to the bomb for it to be disrupted to such an extent that it only left a leg behind. So, who is this person? Number 10, the videotapes. Dozens of video cameras were pointed at the Murrah building on the morning of the bombing. Yet few of those videotapes, if any, have been released showing evidence of what was really going on, including evidence of a Ryder truck on the morning of the bombing. In recent times, the government has claimed that the video cameras on that building and surrounding buildings in downtown Oklahoma City were being changed at 9.02 a.m. all at the same time. This is a ludicrous and outrageous assertion. What do they have to hide? Many of these questions and others could be answered by the release of the security videotapes that surrounded the federal building in Oklahoma City that morning. Furthermore, there were dozens of videotapes in and around the downtown Oklahoma City area and all along the route of the truck bomb from Kansas down to Oklahoma City. If there's nothing to hide and the perpetrators have been brought to justice, why not release these tapes? You need to speak and write to your local congressmen, your representatives, to demand the release of these videotapes. If the official story is not true, accountability is the only way to ensure that further attacks like this do not happen again. Without truth, there is no justice. Okay, now... Now that I've started the subject, that brings us to Tony Farrell. There's a whistleblower in the United Kingdom who just got canned for blowing the whistle. Uh, this is Alex Jones interviewing Tony, and we'll go for about 15 minutes, and uh, then we'll switch to one more cut. It's a three-part interview. We're only going to show the first part, and then a little bit of the last part, which talks about 7-7 which is the bombing in the subways in London. So go ahead and let her rip, and I'll be back in 15 minutes. Before we go to our guest here with just some basic history. Uh, in mainline Roman history, and you learn that Julius Caesar's family actually got political power through this over several generations, fire departments were set up in the big city of Rome, and if your neighborhood did not pay them the fire department fee they would set fires and burn down your neighborhood and over time it grew into a protection racket the sicilian mafia in the last 200 years in italy and the united states in places like uh, new york and boston and other places didn't invent coming to your grocery store or your laundry or your restaurant or your church and saying you need to pay us protection money or somebody's going to burn down your grocery store. I'm not saying who's going to do it, but if you pay me a little protection money and hire my cousin, he'll watch out and make sure nobody burns down your grocery store. And of course, it's the cousin smiling at you from behind the capo that's going to burn down your grocery store. There was a case of this in New York, I don't know, it was a decade ago, got a lot of attention, so I use it as an example, where somebody with ball-peen hammers knocked out hundreds of car windows for years. And folks noticed that there were billboards everywhere for a company that had shops all over the areas that would fix your windshield for the lowest price. And finally, it was discovered when one of the workers blew the whistle that he had upwards of eight people going out every night knocking dings and windshields with ball-peen hammer. Now, that's a false flag, business attack. Uh, there's been a lot of evidence that major virus companies are hiring hackers to release viruses that they then already have the fix to. Uh, I mean, this really is, is common sense. Governments in the West the last hundred years have made drugs illegal. 
because uh, the big uh, powerful interests control the drugs being brought in. Now they can shut down their competition with the law they've bought off, and they can make larger profits because it's now a black market item. This is all really just cause and effect, common sense. Hitler firebombing his own Reichstag, that's now been released and confirmed. Hitler blowing up his own military base, blaming it on uh, the Poles to attack Poland uh, and say, oh, look, the Poles attacked our base, our communications base. They even dressed up prisoners and shot them in Polish uniforms and German uniforms to show newsreels of dead bodies. That's how World War II started. That's publicly admitted. So the point is, you know governments do this. You know Gulf of Tonkin was staged to get us into Vietnam saying our ships were attacked. Now, they said it was a conspiracy theory for 40 years. When on the 40th anniversary, the CIA declassified they staged it. Uh, we already knew because officers on the ships came back uh, and uh, reported, no, we weren't attacked. That was in the San Diego paper back in 64. But it, but it becomes a rumor, a, a legend. People heard it was staged. Well, later it came out it was staged. Uh, and, and there's Operation Gladio, over 200 U.S. bombings carried out with NATO in Europe. Their favorite thing was to blow up school buses because that really got folks upset. And they would grab a patsy, shoot him in the head, and say that, you know, they had uh, committed the bombing of the school bus. So it's time to grow up. The Russians do it. The Tsars did it before the communists. Uh, every major government does this. And, and the argument in the Pentagon is others are doing it. We got to do it. You got uh, Operation Northwoods where the Pentagon proposed to Kennedy to blow up D.C., bomb Miami, hijack jets by remote control, crash them, blame it on the Russians, start World War III. Kennedy said no, and they said, well, then we're going to just take you out. Uh, now, all of that goes on. All of that is happening. And, and, you know, I've talked a lot about this because it was in Newsweek, it was in major newspapers that the hijackers were trained at U.S. bases. Then it came out but was never discussed again. And the head of the Defense Language School, Colonel Butler, went public and said, this is, some of these guys were at our school. I recognize them. Something's going on. The government's behind this. And then they started a court-martial against him, and he shut up, and they dropped the court-martial. So all of that said, I wanted to play this clip before we go to our guest from England for the rest of the hour, and we appreciate his courage in going public and losing his job over this. Uh, and I actually have some of the local papers that reported on it here, but bombshells, Saudi and U.S. government protected hijackers. And of course, I mean, who set up Al-Qaeda? Saudi Arabia, the U.S., England, and Israel, along with Pakistan intelligence in 1979. Zbigniew Brzezinski has written two books in the last five years bragging about it. Uh, and uh, it's the same groups working together. We've had Mr. Springman, the former head of the visa section of the embassy on, uh, where they were ordered. It's been in the Toronto Star. I had him on nine years ago. But I've had him on since. Mr. Springman, I talked to his colleagues. They were ordered to let Muhammad Atta and others back into the U.S., what, eight months before 9-11, even though they were flagged as terrorists in their database. And, and, and the CIA, when they wouldn't let them in, had the State Department call and say, look, they work for us. That's a cover. The underwear bomber, Under Secretary of State. Kennedy admits they were ordered to help get him on the plane by an unnamed U.S. agency and to give them the visa. We knew it a month and a half before because our listeners, lawyers, uh, the Haskells, husband and wife lawyers, were on and saw the guy being got on the plane, thought it was suspicious, didn't have his passport, saw the whole firecracker deal right as they were all, I mean, it's all staged. Uh, now, now uh, the Fast and Furious, shipping guns in to the drug dealers to then blame it on the Second Amendment. Now they've announced the gun control because of their own operation. It's happening. I mean, they know what they're doing. And, and so it's time to grow up and realize this is happening. Now, here is a former uh, governor of Florida, a former uh, senator and Florida governor, Bob Graham, said at least two of the purported 9-11 hijackers had assistance from Saudi Arabia. Graham's recently released novel, Keys to the Kingdom, implicates the Saudi. He told MSNBC uh, the novel is based on factual information. Let's go ahead and play that clip from MSNBC. Well, just briefly, Thomas, there are some unquestioned facts that Saudi Arabia was providing significant assistance to at least two of the 19 hijackers living in San Diego. The mm -hmm. questions are why was Saudi Arabia doing this? W was it also providing assistance to the other 17 hijackers? And then why did the United States go to such lengths, including censuring uh, the congressional inquiries report uh, on the events leading up to 9-11? that related to the role of Saudi Arabia. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, and the keys to the kingdom starts with finding those answers. If you say that 40% of what's in this book is... Okay, think there we go. Allow for avenues of discussion. Oh, that's good. 
All right, now we are going to our guest, uh, Tony Farrell, served as a high-level intelligence analyst for South Yorkshire Police in Britain from 98 to 2010. In the days preceding the fifth anniversary of the 7-7 bombings, Farrell discovered the 9-11 attacks and 7-7 attacks were acts of state-sponsored terror, and Jaron gave me a more detailed uh, bio on him. He has a university degree in Applied Statistics, Sheffield Hallam University, if I'm reading that right. Postgraduate degree in Criminal Intelligence uh, Analytics uh, and Analysis, Manchester University. Postgrad degree, Management Studies, Sheffield. Uh, and we continue uh, on from there, uh, studying future threats. And he was the head of the South Yorkshire Police uh, of uh, their program to analyze uh, terror attacks and uh, threats, uh, and he joins us now, former intelligence analyst, and I have some of the uh, news articles here dealing with it. Police intelligence analyst fired for blowing whistle on false flag terror. Strategic threat assessment matrix concluded 7-7 was an inside job. Tony Farrell uh, is our guest uh, going over that. Um, and we also have mainstream British reports where they admit that most of the IRA bombings were actually run by British intelligence and British Army officers, some of which we've interviewed here. One of them got killed after he was on the show. Not trying to scare folks, just telling you this is not a game. Uh, Mr. Farrell, thank you for joining us and thank you for your courage. Thank you, Alex. And it's a pleasure to be on. So uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you, your years of research, and what brought you uh, to going public with this information and what... The, 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 the police department uh, thought when you brought them this information? Well, I've been working for the police service for, uh, as a principal analyst since 1998 and had local government experience and also worked uh, for the regional um, government office, which is part of the home office, uh, doing research into crime. So I was quite experienced as a civilian. I wasn't a police officer. And um, I was used to doing the strategic work. I wasn't privy to the detailed terrorist information from special branch. But I did take an overview of the sanitized versions and pull them together in a strategic set. That was my assignment, my annual assignment. And um, what happened, Alex, was that, uh, as you say, a week up to uh, leading up to the 2010 July the 7th uh, five-year anniversary, I was merely going along with my assignment, believing that I was just going to be able to complete it without any problems. And um, unfortunately uh, for me, uh, Running concurrently was my home study that was into things like the history of geopolitics and what was going on in the world and a bit of church history. Um, and all of a sudden, with a week to go, Alex, I dropped on uh, through the likes of your program um, the possibility of 9 11 being an inside job. That quickly uh, triggered me to do a lot of research um, in, in haste at home and um, hoping to get reassurance that that wouldn't be the case. And unfortunately, it was, as, as I could see, it was, you know, damning evidence. I panicked. I went to my church minister to say, what do we do in this situation? And he, he just said, well, terrible, isn't it? Have you thought about checking out 7-7? Well, I thought, oh, dear, I better check that out, too. And now we're only talking two or three days to go before the assignment's due. So I took a day's annual leave and uh, did everything possible. Uh, stayed awake for 24 hours. That, too, wasn't long before it was so obvious, Alex, that it was an inside job as well. Uh, there's just damning information out there. And that threw me in a problem, Alex, because I had to go to uh, the, uh, the, the, what we call the, an intelligence strategy management board on the 8th of July. Um, and, it, and part of the assignment was a, a threat assessment that covered terrorism and the component part would normally expect me to go along with all the government rhetoric and narrative on this, which would be to say that the threat, the large threat, was essentially from Islamic terrorism. Well, I'm sorry, um, if 9-11 if was an inside job and 7-7 was an inside job, how could it possibly rely upon government rhetoric to actually say that it was Islamic terrorists as the biggest threat? Because all right, Mr. Farrell, Mr. Farrell, quick break, stay right there. Uh, absolutely. These are the big attacks. These are causing the large numbers of death. If that's an inside job, then you do the statistical analysis. Then, then the government-sponsored terror is the most dangerous. We'll continue with where this led on the other side. So for 12 years, for the big city government and for the central government of the Home Office, the U.K., 
He's an analyst looking at future terror threats, analyzing where the terror threat comes from. Well, if you're actually a real researcher, you would know that there was BBC, London Telegraph. I've got all the articles. Uh, police sees files of spy link to IRA murders. Uh, it goes on and on. Double agent was the real IRA's Omaha bomb team. And I've had these guys on. And hidden in all these articles, because they report on it, but they bury it, it turns out that 7 out of 10 IRA commanders, going back 50 years, on average, were British intelligence. Staging terror attacks as a pretext to stay in Northern Ireland and to take the rights of Brits, now the most surveilled people on Earth. But, but side issue. The point is, is that this stuff's all hidden in plain view. Now, Tony Farrell, their chief analyst, uh, you know, just a week or so out from this big report, he, in his research, he, he, he finds reality. And what happened when you brought them the report, sir? Please continue. Well, the first thing you did, Alex, when this, this horrible uh, realization occurred to me, I thought that uh, um, I had to go and alert management. And I did that, Alex, with a briefing note, because we were getting very close to the deadline. This was the 6th of July. The deadline was required on the 8th of July. So I, I, I made it um, my business to alert management. It is shocking. I shocked them uh, with a briefing note uh, that gave all the hyperlinks. So I, I alerted them to your, your, your films. I alerted them to Loose Change and the, video, the compelling videos that were out there. That was on 9-11 and all. likewise with 7-7. The research, the compelling research, and I was saying to management, look, it's a case of Houston, we've got a problem here, and uh, we need to have a look at it because things aren't the way they seem. And that, that shocked management, um, and they really, on the 7th of July, they really sort of tried to wrap me up in cock con socks, of Alex, and tried me to get a, a, go along with it and not rock the boat and go to the Intelligence Strategy Management Board on the 8th, disregarding what I believe to be the threat, and just carry on as normal. Um, I'd done all the work, uh, so I was in a position where I could have actually carried out and handed over the assignment to their satisfaction. They'd have loved that. My problem was it would go against my conscience. And quite frankly, Alex, um, this was a case I couldn't keep silent on. Silence, uh, you know, is, is, is you know, it's is not golden, it's yellow. And I wasn't going to be cowardly over this. I had to make a stance. It was a defining moment on the fifth anniversary, that 7th of July, 2010, I came to that decision in my own conscience that I must make the stand. And on the 8th of July, I went in and made my stand and refused to hand over the product that they wanted later on for that afternoon's presentation to the Intelligence Strategy Management Board. I was asked then to explain myself in a report. I was sent home um, away from the office uh, where they did an audit of my computer. And uh, I was asked to come back in a few days' time with a report that explained why I felt necessary to make the stand, which I duly did. I, I told them all the reasons. I made inferences on the strategic threat to do with the New World Order. Okay, uh, now we're going to skip the middle part of the interview, but right there he's already talking about, you know, his realization. It's kind of hard to understand his accent a little bit, but he's talking about his realization that things were not as represented by the government. Now, we came to that here about 9-11, and, you know, that started a lot of us looking backwards and forwards. Well, before I get too carried away, we're going to play the last part of this interview where he actually starts talking about 7-7. So, let her rip. Right, okay, well, uh, 7th of July, 2005, and... Um, London bombings went off, and there were three underground stations and uh, a bomb that went off on Tavistock Square. Uh, now, a um, few things that happened, um, 52 people were killed, plus four others, which was the alleged suicide bombers. Now, there was no inquiry into who committed the crime. Tony Blair uh, immediately said that there would be, uh, an inquiry would be a ludicrous diversion. That's another disgrace. And instead, we've been told who is guilty, and we've had, we've had an in, a diversionary inquiry later on down the line just about the intelligence failures, where the real agenda is simply to conceal the truth, as you say, you know, just as it was in the Hutton inquiry for Dr. David Kelly. Now, there was a poor quality and anonymous 
official version of the London bombings, and that's deeply un- uh, suspicious and unacceptable. And um, add to that, there's, there's never been the proper inquiry, so you've got big problems there, Alex. And for a government to give us one narrative of 7-7 without allowing all the other competing narratives to be officially heard in the process, it's simply insulting, it's a disgrace. Now, a key thing here is the, um, the mock terror exercise that occurred. Now, this is fantastic, this. Um, Peter Power, advisor consultant, um, when all the bombs go off, shortly afterwards, we're talking an hour or so after the bombs have gone off, this guy, Peter Power, advisor consultant, goes on TV and announces this. He says that uh, this is amazing. We, we, the, 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 the terror attack, the, the terror training drill that we are into at the moment, where there's a thousand staff involved, has actually was simulating bombs going off at the exact same stations and locations as it actually happened. Now, in statistical terms, Alex, it's as certain as certain can be that a drill exercise matches the exact same locations and dates of the actual bombs. That could not have occurred by mere coincidence. Now, was that investigated? No. Should it have been? Well, you're damn right it should. That, that and by the way, we're going to break. we got two more offers, segments. offers the insight that's needed to find out really what happened. And it's a, it's a disgrace that it... All right, stay there, sir. We got to go to break, and we're going to come back and let you finish on that. We got one little segment in that first five minutes of the hour, and we got guests coming in. We'll definitely have to have you back up in the future just to go over your own research. But absolutely, they ran drills on 9 11, Oklahoma City. They always run a drill to cover the real attack. You know, a lot of people engage in delusional, magical thinking. They think that you can just decide there aren't false flag terror attacks. I mean, you you, you read the history of France and England fighting with each other and others. They were constantly doing it. Constantly doing dirty tricks against each other. Blowing up an ammo dump and then blaming it on the other. This is war. The issue is war is now being used against us domestically by our own governments. That's an act of war shipping tens of thousands of firearms into Mexico then blame it on the Second Amendment. And it's admitted the government did that. Okay, people, we need to grow up or they're going to keep using this tool. So this is a short five-minute segment. Sorry, we got one more little five-minute segment, and we'll have to have you back. But continuing talking to Tony Farrell, who was uh, in his police department and also worked in the federal government as a top terror analyst, ran into all this false flag history and information. You, you, you'd gotten into the drills of 7-7 with the exact same bus, exact same place, exact same time, exact same trains, exact same place, exact same plot time. Actuaries have been done. It's in the thousands of tractagillions. That's, you know, billions of times all the sand grains in the world. It's nearing infinity. Uh, I mean, it's the equivalent of finding a unicorn, a leprechaun, and Santa Claus in your backyard uh, jumping rope. It doesn't exist, uh, but uh, please continue. Yeah, the uh, spineless, anonymous Home Office uh, official version, uh, that had uh, flaws in it that uh, subsequently the government had to admit for a lot that there were lies. The 740 ghost train that uh, went from London to um, St. Pancras that the uh, Patsy's was supposed to be on, but they didn't catch because the train never ran, and that was only an independent researcher that found that out later on and uh, shamed the government. Uh, when they had to change it, but they couldn't get the story to fit. So that, that, that whole sort of patch of the report is ludicrous. And, of course, why run the drill? Well, you've got some young Arab gentlemen who are working, you know, with the government, who are teachers and things. They're taking part in a patriotic anti-terror drill. Uh-oh, something's going to happen. Yeah. And then, uh, Alex, I'm afraid I, uh, the, the, you know, at least one or two of those, uh, you know, uh, patsies were, were, were taken out and assassinated at Canary Wharf is the most plausible explanation. I certainly don't believe they were on the trains. Or, and the military tried to uh, start explosives on the trains. Um, a far more plausible explanation than the um, so-called uh, explosions on the uh, in the back packet is that uh, they self-detonated themselves uh, in wonderful synchrony. So uh, all of that seems totally ludicrous. The, the profiles of these bombers, uh, it, it, the personification of these people was not such that these were going to uh, commit suicide. And if they've got videos that purport that they were, uh, I actually believe that was part of a train drill. So there's so many things wrong with it. And I think... Um, 
we look at the G8 summit on the day of Glen Eagles and uh, what on earth was Tony Blair doing uh, a few hours later coming on record when the police hadn't uh, had announced that we don't know who's done this yet, but Tony Blair does. He knows this has been done in the name of Islam. Um, now, I think that is a disgrace. I think that is unacceptable. But I wish just good people in the UK would actually see it because I think they're blind. Well, it gets worse people. at the uh, Tavistock Institute bus bombing. It turns out there were people with fake bandages on who were seen before and then after with them off, you know, covering their whole faces, being bandaged up. They even, I mean, this was, this was off the charts, uh, insane and uh, openly, openly staged. And uh, the reason they had to admit they were doing drills is because people who were part of the drill then start questioning what happened, but by seeing an authority figure admit the drill, then they think it's all out in the open. That's why Larry Silverstein admits they blew up Building 7. We'll be right back. Yeah, okay. Now, before we get too much further, uh, we have the 10-year anniversary of 9-11 coming up right quick, in just a few more weeks. And I've already, as you can see behind me, I've got the a special slot the day before 9-11 on 9-10. We have a two-hour live slot, and I'm going to be trying to invite oh, other speakers, and we'll try to make a good live show out of it. Uh, you can see here the replays. There will be a replay on 9-11 at 5 p.m. It's a two-hour show, also following it on Monday and Wednesday and Thursday. So, and, and look at the times. They're all pr primo viewing times. I got to thank you to PCM for the great scheduling. And uh, anyway, uh, if you have any ideas for how to make this anniversary show a really good anniversary show um why don't you write me uh my email 251 omega at comcast.net you'll see it at the end of the show also now um we're going to open up the phone lines in a little bit but first we're going to play a little bit of this one more alex jones clip the reason i'm playing this it it shows just how ordinary people can become activists and really make a difference and that's got to be the message that we're going to have to get out be you know as we get to this 9-11 anniversary that if we're waiting for somebody else to do it it's not going to happen remember last time i played a clip of uh, mike Gravel suggesting that we do a initiative petition push all across the country maybe get five or six states doing an initiative petition uh, to, to try to get a new investigation on the uh, horizon. Uh, but th that brings up an interesting point here. Remember the last video, Tony Blair, an inquiry into this bombing would be a ludicrous diversion. What, when a bombing happens, the, you should put every bit of investigation that you possibly can onto it. When, when buildings in New York suddenly collapse for the first time in history due to a fire, we should have the most investigation of any crime site that you've ever seen. But that brings about an easy way, a litmus test, to tell if you're talking to somebody who is deliberately trying to spread disinformation and trying to stop the advance of truth in the 9-11 movement, how can you tell? I'll tell you how you can tell. Bring the conversation around to a new investigation, and no matter how you word the, the, the question, no matter how reasonable it sounds to start a new investigation, if your opponent is a government shill, paid or unpaid, voluntary or involuntary, he will come up with excuse after excuse for why we should not investigate. And of course, there is no reason not to investigate, so these folks reveal themselves right off the bat. Well, let's go to this cut seven then, and uh, I'll be back shortly for your co phone calls at the end of the show. We got Matthew Medina and Cody Hess, great political activist, uh, with a lot of news joining us coming up the next segment. They've also brought a friend along, um, Miss French, but we're gonna be, um, Talking more in the future with Tony Farrell. He's got a website going up soon. He's going to be publishing stuff as like, you know, an open source analyst for the people. We also need to support him uh, in what he's doing there in Airstrip One. Uh, Tony, you were making the point during the break to myself. You've been out for a week now, 
or five, six days and no mainstream media uh, in England. You would think this would be newsworthy that a head analyst at a police department, a guy who was an analyst for the central government, the home office, comes out with this and that they're staying quiet. They don't want folks to look into this. Uh, on a, a lot of truth websites all over the world, uh, in, in a remarkably short space of time, following the uh, the interview I did with on Rich, richplanet.com, um, and I point out, Alex, that there's an over you know people don't have to take my word for it. They can Google, they can search the web, and there's some fantastic analysis. The big picture, seven seven, the ripple effect, uh, seeds of deconstruction. All these documentaries are so superior to the government version. And people need to make their own mind up. They need to start looking because it, there's utterly compelling evidence that makes the government version ludicrous. And we've had a recent inquiry, Alex, as you know, uh, uh, to look at intelligence failures, Lady Justice Hallett. And um, don't take my analysis. I've not gone into too much detail on that. But there's a chap called Nick Collistrum who's done de who, who stayed every day at the inquiry and has done detailed analysis that completely discredits uh, the whole of that inquiry, and uh, that needs to be seen and needs to be heard because that inquiry never allowed any searching questions to be asked. Why not? Um, and there's counter narrative, there's narrative, there's analysis that ruins the inquiry's verdict. And if that's the case, we, we've got corruption in the court too. I'm afraid, and the, the people, the certain witnesses aren't being allowed to call, so it's all biased. So where do you go? We've got to get a breakthrough to mainstream media. We've got to get the public alerted because I'm afraid, Alex, it's a bit like you say it is in America. People are just blind to it and they turn a blind eye and they're cowardly and they need to wake up. Uh, it's hard as it may seem, but uh, we can't keep silent any longer. And uh, we need to put pressure through my court case. We can put pressure on one police force. You know, we can, the court, this is potentially one means to, to really put pressure on the government. So I think, Alex, there's going to be a, move, a truth movement behind the progression of my court case, um, and that might help. Yeah, it might help put a good pressure on, because uh, certainly 9-11 and 7-7 will be discussed in the court. At the pre-hearing review, we touched on 9-11, and the, my beliefs on 9-11, you know, similar to yours, but the judge thought they were absurd. Right, and he's on record as saying that. So um, we've got absurd beliefs, Alex, um, but we've got the real beliefs, I believe, is the gist of it. So that needs to be in the public domain, and we need to get the people to look at it. All right, well, Tony Farrell, we just appreciate your courage and the fact that, uh, you know, you could have just gone along with the official story and not lost your job. You've done a lot more than most people would ever even think about doing, and it's going to be men and women of conscience who do stand up and at least have the courage to speak out against the lies uh, that are going to turn the tide against this evil. I mean, all the lies about WMDs, the fake intelligence, the other stage terror attacks that have been declassified. Uh, if you've got groups that have done this before and they have the motive and they stand to gain and only they can carry it out and a SWAT, the supposed head of the bombings, it turns out is MI6. I mean, even Fox News and Associated Press have covered that. This stuff comes out, and then nothing's ever done, and then you and analysts go look at all this information, and they say, you're fired. Uh, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Mr. Farrell, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to talking to you again in the future. We'll have you back as a criminologist to really walk through all of this, not just your case, in the near future. Godspeed. Thank you, Alex. God bless. Thank you, sir. We've got guests coming in studio, coming up. Stay with us. yourselves what are you doing in this time of great challenge what are you doing to unlock minds
I guess now for a few years I have uh, known Matthew Medina, and, I, and I've seen the videos online with Cody Hess. They're great activists, and they're also radio talk show hosts. I can hear them here locally uh, in Austin on 90.1 uh, weeknights, and uh, I just really enjoy listening to their show when I'm driving home uh, later in the evening and tuning into it. So I thought, why not have Matthew Medina and Cody Hess in studio? And they brought another We Are Change uh, activist, uh, Rachel French, uh, along with them. And they're going to be with us for the rest of the hour. We'll have to get some headphones on towards the end, because I am going to uh, take some calls from 9-11 uh, truthers out there or folks that disagree with us. But we're going to see a lot of attacks uh, coming up in the future against 9-11 truth, because it's out there that government stage terror. It's out there that Obama shipped guns into Mexico to blame the Second Amendment. He doesn't care that he's been caught. They're still going to use it and are now announcing they're using it to go after the Second Amendment. They're telling gun shops how many guns they can sell now outside of law. That's called dictatorship. I don't have a law, but I'm the decider, so that's the way it is. We've had this slide towards tyranny, but now you got Mitch McConnell yesterday saying, we'll just give Obama the power of the purse, violates Article 1, Section 8, to another extent, uh, Section 7, Article 1, Section 7. Uh, this is all happening right now, and coming up later, we've got Ron Paul grilling uh, the head bankster, uh, Ben Bernanke, and... Uh, uh, Bernanke tell Paul, gold is not money. Our fiat money is money. And they're going into uh, QE3 now, like Mexico did back in the 80s, devaluing the dollar. Uh, the, 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 the peso soon will be on par with the dollar, uh, to give people an idea, or I guess with the old ruble. Uh, and, uh, but they're telling us there's no inflation. It's very low. Everything's fine. Uh, but more and more, they're having to admit, no, we're actually in a depression. So a lot is happening. And, I, I mean, I don't know where to start with you guys. Uh, you're doing a great job down in San Antonio. And there's other people spontaneously all over the country confronting politicians with the real questions, uh, uh, involved in activist actions. Uh, but uh, Matthew, Cody, uh, and, of course, she didn't really want to be interviewed, but we drug her in here. Uh, Rachel, I, I mean, just what do you think is most important happening in the world right now? It's that, like, people are really starting to get active. I mean, I think that's the most important thing is that people now are using the information they know to hit the streets and to get something done. Yeah, definitely. I would say one of the most important things to talk about right now is activism. The activism is red hot. I mean, we can look around the world and see the, the uh, revolutions, and, of course, they're staged, and we can see all this. But here is something genuine in the Infowar activism. We want to uh, highlight that because that's what we've been doing. That's what I've been doing for four years now in San Antonio, as you know, because I've seen you a lot, you know, around here in Texas doing, doing activism, man. It's been nonstop. And definitely so much going on in the world like you just brought up. But, I mean... Uh, specifically, the Operation Gunrunner, um, uh, Fast and the Furious, we've planned two street actions for this month. Um, uh, one of our friends, Henry Havoc, from uh, We Are Change San Antonio, made this sweet little box, and it opens up. What is Fast and the Furious? It opens up, and we're going to put the articles and a flyer and everything. And it's like a presentation, and we, we intro them to the false flag uh, of this whole uh, ATF, letting the guns walk. And we're accustomed to making DVDs that we're going to hand out. So there's two actions we're going to do on that topic this month. And, uh, and I should also add, you guys make videos of the actions that you know, have been seen by millions of people. And this is an example of how the alternative media is becoming the mainstream media. But, but getting into Fast and Furious, uh, now uh, it's coming out that, that the government actually shipped them and delivered them to Los Zetas. Well, Sully Castillo told us that six years ago and again five years ago. And they locked him up. And they locked him up for it. I mean, their lives are finally eroding. It's just starting to get like that. I mean, this, the more this stuff gets out there in the open and exposed, I mean, the more we have an opportunity to wake everybody up. And the else. people that have said, we're kooks, they're the fools. Fifteen years ago, I had government documents. They knew that cell phones were causing brain cancer. Well, here it is, Fox News, CNN, cell phones, cancer, and fertility, 100% fact. See? Yeah, yeah, just like they knew asbestos was bad. If you want to go old school, they know a lot of these things are bad for us, and that's why it's our duty to expose it. And right now is the time. Everybody has information. We're seeing young people waking up when we do yeah. street actions. I mean, the people that recognize this the most on the streets of San Antonio are teenagers watching our YouTube videos. So it's a good thing to, uh, to, to, I mean, that's a really positive thing, a bright thing for the future. So definitely encouraging all the listeners to take action. Yeah, the new, the new generation is the way of the future. Like right here we got an article, Ron Paul, uh, why the young flock to an old idealist. I mean, they, they try to frame it like he's an old guy, he's, it's old ideals, but really, I mean, this guy is putting every, everything that all young folk would like. I mean, all young generation wants to be free. They don't want to live in this tyranny they see, and they see their future eroding. That's what I see. I mean, I'm young, I'm 21 years old. I see like 10 years from now, I mean, am I going to have a future? It doesn't look like it. You know, Not if we let these criminals world. continue to blow stuff up and take our rights and pose as our savior. Uh, Rachel, uh, how did you get uh, woken up? Well, I started looking into videos 
was online, and uh, I started kind of. Oh, no, it's okay. They're moving it over. We need to hook a few more up in there. Go ahead. Um, basically, well, at first, I didn't really want to believe a lot of the things that I was, you know, finding, and I kind of like looked the other way. But you get to a point where you can't because there's just so many facts, you know, that are just like right in front of your face. I think people just like to live like I don't know in their own world and you know not really acknowledge like what's going on and that's like a source of frustration I think for all of us because it's like we're trying to wake people up and a lot of people like don't want to hear it. Well, yeah, I mean if we got killers running things, we better get them out of there. We're not safe. Kind of face reality. Yeah, it's definitely just a basic gut reaction to all this information. I mean, what are we supposed to do? To find out about all this and not do anything? We're just supposed to stay home and play video games? Are we not supposed to get fired up about this? Are we just supposed to get fired up about, what, uh, Xbox Live, PS3, watching some HD? I mean, come on, there's some serious stuff that's going on. We need good people to stand up, stand for what's right. And yeah, a lot of people put up a fake front that they don't want to hear this because they're faking it themselves. They're not an inner peace and ready and willing to stand up for those around to stand for what's good and that's what we're trying to do we are change san antonio truth exposed radio and we are, we are encouraging and highlighting all the other people feeling the same way as us the guys in dallas the health and light guys who uh i, I know they got in the top 10 the v for victory uh video where they just plastered posters everywhere they just made the yeah, global video. The whole dallas area they had two videos that uh, were posters. just on the front of Infowars recently in the last week they're awesome they're no, awesome. no no i mean listen they got passion we got passion and, and, and listen they can't kill or lock us all up and and it's growing exponentially yeah. take luke radowski they kicked him out of 9 11 truth because it was pretty much controlled in new york to a certain extent i put him on air said folks follow this example the, the cops tried to say he had bombs turned yeah. out that was yeah. fake it, it, it totally exploded and then he was an example to others now you're an example to others. Yeah. It's a chain reaction. What do you make of Bob Graham coming out on MSNBC, one of the top 9-11 commissioners, and saying the U.S. government did protect the hijackers? They're finally having to come out with their lies because, I mean, 9-11 truth is going so much to where they're, now they're going to have to say, yeah, it is that way, but... You know, what are you guys going to do about it? Well, their new hoax is 9-11 Truth dead. Are you kidding? Yeah. Are you it's kidding on me? fire everywhere. D d nine years ago, I, most of the radio stations kicked me off because of 9-11 Truth. Now they're putting me on because of it. It, uh, it. It's totally mainline now. So the BBC's running yeah, this hoax yeah. that, oh, 9-11 Truth's dead. Uh, yeah, folks. Yeah, it's a war tactic to a war tactic to get all of us is to be like, oh, you've lost. The war's that. over. Yeah, yeah. Go home. No, it's That's what they want. Anniversary. Well, it's also saying that. cease fire, and then they fire all their weapons. Because everyone yeah, yeah. in this already is so frustrated, like she was saying, um, that people just won't accept the knowledge. They won't wake up. So you can get frustrated because it's like you see all this going on, but people around you they won't wake up to it, and then if they, even if they do wake up to it, they won't get active with it. And I think that's that's all that really matters. I mean, just knowing the knowledge isn't enough now. I mean, that time has passed. Now we're at the precipice. Okay, we, we cut the video short. You can always check out that video on YouTube or go to the Alex Jones channel and check it out. I recommend that you do that anyway. Alex Jones gets out more information in five minutes than I do in my whole show. So anyway, we're going to the caller. Go ahead, caller. Hey, I'm here. Hello. Hey, yeah, I'm, I'm glad uh, I finally got through. I tried to call you guys once before. My well, it gets pretty Steve. hectic. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing, you know, that all the uh, things that I have seen in connection to everything concerning 9-11, and, you know, I try to evoke some kind of common sense in all areas of my life, okay? Good idea. And, and no, no matter what it is, spirituality, whatever, you know, I, want, I try to stay grounded and keep my feet on the ground. <laughs> and normally, you know, when one and one don't add to two, there's something rotten in Denmark. And by all the evidence that I have been able to, <laughs> you know, been able to observe, I've come to one logical conclusion. NBC, shortly after 9-11 occurred, they ran this, uh, this uh, particular CD, which I viewed, down in Los Angeles, and uh, the records for this, this type of um, wiring, they, the, both towers were rewired, uh, I think two months prior to them being brought down. And the records for that were in Building 7, and there was two okay. people that were still in, in Building 7 when it was being demoed. One of the guys who witnessed it, who heard the explosions and survived uh, the collapse of Building 7, was, I can't remember the man's name. Barry he Jennings? Black, uh, he's a black man and uh, oh. kind of old beast, wore glasses. I saw him in one of these tapes, and he went on to say that he heard the explosions, he, he knew what was going on, they busted a hole through the side of the wall to get him and 
a agent. Oh yeah, that sounds like Barry Jennings, but I'm not sure. But he was the janitor for all three buildings, or you know, custody. But, under. Uh, he was in Building Seven, and he was going to testify to the fact that he heard the explosions and he saw the building being brought down, demolition style. He was dead in two months. And guess what? Yeah, that's right. He he was mysteri- He mysteriously died later. He was in his fifties, so he wasn't even an old guy. Exactly. But uh, and, you know, it's, it's, it was was. It's interesting, the government has this agent, it's an explosive, but it's not really, whatever it comes in contact with, it will consume whatever it is, and it will burn for 30 days until it consumes everything that, that you know, it's around it to consume, and it will burn itself out after 30 days, which yeah, is they're... coincidentally how long the whole end ground zero burnt for. Right, they burn and burn and burn. They were finding molten metal like three, four, or five weeks later. Okay, After and spring the reason water on it. the government shipped off all the iron from <laughs> the Twin Towers yeah. over to Japan to be melted down so we could not do the forensics on the investigation to prove that there was explosive agents that brought the building down. And that down. alone should make people stand up. You know, what do you, th- what do you think we should do for this anniversary show that's coming up? I wrote a song about it. I wrote a song on the day that it happened. Oh. I'm a musician. Well, and hey, then, I'll play it if you send it in. That's, uh, last week, I wrote this other song. Actually, two weeks ago. Uh, I won't say exactly you know, the words that I wrote, because it's a little colorful, but maybe you'll get the gist of it. And uh, I'll just read it to you, okay? Well, I'm not going to sing it to you. But it's, uh, ain't this about uh, a bleep you want me to believe? All the filthy, stinking lies that you can conceive. You must think we're all stupid that we really can't see through your mealy mouth BS, through your conspiracy. Man, stand up, man up, and tell the world the truth. Everybody wants to believe in the fantasies of our youth. By the people, for the people, classroom mere daydreams. Got nothing to do with your power craze, money grubbing schemes. Somehow, somewhere, somebody forgot the sacred oath. You swore by God till your death you always would uphold. Feels like you sold us down the river without a single prayer. Floating down the river, the saints are drowning here. Sold down the river by them who are bought and sold. Sold down the river such a long, long time ago. All right. Man, that's going to be on YouTube when I get this posted, and people all over the world will see it. What I just just said? Yeah. So You you ought to hear the one I wrote the day that it happened. We're we're out of time now. Oh, I'm sorry. But no, that listen, if you have these recorded or anything, if you're actually singing them and performing them, send me a copy. I'll put it on this show. I would love to. I just, right now, I'm, I'm going through a lot of changes. Because uh, of the all... information that I have, I've had, it, I had an attempt on my life. I have information in regards to what the government's been doing for years. Well, 251. Miracle, I'm still alive. 251 Omega at Comcast.net. 251omega at comcast.net. We're off the air. Thank you for watching. Watch again in August.